thank you very much, um, and a warm welcome from me um, to all of you this afternoon. Um, what I propose we do is um, in, in this session is to zoom in on some of the aspects that we've just heard about um, in terms of what are the obligations on national courts and what does that mean in practice. So what do you have to um, bear in mind as you look at what national courts do? Um, so what I propose we do is that I, I try to put a bit of um, coherence around the guiding principles because I find uh, I get lost very easily in those different scenarios. We've heard it's very important to understand and that's absolutely correct. Um, what is the parallelism, if any, between court procedures at national level and what goes on in Brussels or Luxembourg? There are a few principles that actually help categorizing and navigating that if new circumstances and new scenarios crop up. That's what I'll start with. And then I'll take a bit the position of the competitor in national court. And um, so what differences do they encounter depending on after they are in national court, um, things happen at EU level. Um, to then move on and take the opposite position of um, a company that's facing a recovery order and challenges that in national court. So after what we've heard, is there much hope for them is really, I think, the question. Um, and then uh, I'll try to sort of draw some conclusions um, with which, you know, some of you may agree or disagree and maybe we can have a discussion about that. Um, so with that, maybe straight into the guiding um, EU law principles. And I'm not suggesting um, that this will all be very, very new and exciting. Um, primacy of EU law is, I think, the unfortunate truth for all of what we're discussing when it comes to recovery. Whenever there is recovery, um, there is the standstill obligation. We've heard about that. That has direct effect. We know that. So there is a legal basis for competitors and some third parties to actually approach approach national courts and get their individual rights that arise out of allegedly unlawful aid, aid that was granted without approval where it's needed, um, and that is what national courts must safeguard. That is extremely important, um, and if one loses sight of that, um, one can get things quite wrong. Um, then the other bit, commission decisions are binding. And that goes for all of them, including, and that was what national courts have been struggling with for a long, long while until we heard um, the European of Court of Justice explaining it, even for opening decisions that open the formal investigation. And then appeals that you may launch in Luxembourg at the general court against the commission decision, whichever it may be, as long as you have standing and you've heard all about that, do not have suspensive effect. Uh, that is a very, very sad reality um, if you are um, an alleged beneficiary. It's wonderful, one would hope, if you're a competitor, but that's the dichotomy of how state aid um, law is applied. Um, you always have those two sides if it gets to recovery. So the same goes for interim measures against commission decisions. Um, theoretically, we've heard that. Um, you can get them in Luxembourg. That's where they properly need to be granted because we've heard, and that's correct, national courts cannot disagree or disregard, ignore um, commission decisions. But the thresholds are high. That's why I'm saying theoretically, very rarely ever granted, and we know that. So the bottom line is national courts generally have an obligation to recover aid. Now, even the Court of Justice says that is not absolute, but those exceptional circumstances, we've heard that too, hardly ever exist. Absolute impossibility, and we've heard 
the existence of a company itself, so putting it in bankruptcy, liquidating it, is not an excuse. One of the marked differences between antitrust, a lot of you might know that there, if the Commission has imposed fines, you have an excuse, a defense of inability to pay. Very hard to understand to a lot of our clients in private practice when we say, well, you might have difficulty repaying aid with interest, but there's no way around it. So, you know, even if you think, and even if you're right, you might be bankrupted over it. That is the horrible truth of it. And that is why there, where there is a state aid risk that's large in number, it is a real risk. Um, but that's a different discussion. General principles of EU law, something that we'll get to a bit later when I speak about the possible defenses and what's left of them, um, can be argued, are always argued, um, very rarely successful. Um, and then, of course, if you're lucky enough at the end of a process and you get a final decision from the Commission declaring the aid, notified aid, compatible, then there will be no recovery. And that can take years and years and years. And if there's been unnotified in there, we've heard, there's still that little add-on of the illegality interest. So the period of time for which you've had the aid before you had the, um, the positive decision, interest for that period will have to be recovered. And then on the other side, there is the procedural autonomy of the national court. And that's where the music really is. So that's where member states, actually, member states' courts actually have some leeway um, to the extent, and that's the problem, um, they apply, of course, national procedural law, but on two conditions. One, national procedure must be effective. So they cannot make it practically impossible for recovery to be effected. Um, and they must be equivalent. So you cannot have different rules for recovery of EU state aid versus debt to the state, for example. And the trick then is, what do national courts do if the national procedure doesn't get them to effective recovery? We've heard two into four months. Well, once you're in a national court, I assure you that's long past. Thankfully, those four and four months are an obligation on the member state, correct. Um, the Commission will hold the member state responsible, not the individual court. But still, time pressure is on. Um, so what does the national court do? Well, it has to be creative is the answer that came out of Luxembourg. So you start out and you interpret national law to the extent you can, and that's different in different member states. Courts can do different things um, to actually make it possible to order recovery, or if that doesn't work, you disregard national law, something that particularly lower courts have great difficulty. And that might work with some procedural rules when it comes to constitutional principles. A lot of courts, even Supreme Courts, have huge difficulty in saying, oh, we need to affect recovery, so we'll just ignore the Constitution. Well, sad news is they ought to do that. Remember, primacy of EU law. So if national law stands in the way of effective recovery, sorry, you have to work around it. So use any other available measures or create them. Not easy in practice. Now, with that, by way of introduction, um, let's go into sort of the competitors or third parties that seek recovery in national law. And we've already heard this is just a, an overview. We'll go through the different steps of what might happen or might not happen at um, EU level um, to see what, how those um, obligations on national courts actually vary. So you can have um, the
those four basic different scenarios that I've outlined, and let's go in there one by one. So if you don't have a commission decision, you have no notification, no aid notification, or um, you have a notification, but you have no commission decision, what is your national court obliged to do? If you approach them, what do you tell them they must do, or what do you need to expect them to do? Well, that is where national courts have their biggest role, because that is where they actually decide, is that measure aid? So does it meet the four criteria of 1071? Maybe it's de minimis, then it's not aid. Maybe it's existing aid, then no recovery lies. Or it's covered by the general block exemption, one of the bigger uh, playgrounds in the future given the extended thresholds for aid under the block exemption. So is it aid and has it been granted, has it been paid? So is the standstill obligation violated? Those are the key threshold question that the national courts must determine and they cannot get out of that. That is their obligation at that stage. Now if they determine that those conditions are met, then they are under the obligation that we've heard about to actually safeguard third parties' rights under Article 1083, which means undo the distortion of competition, and that basically means recover aid with interest. There's no compatibility analysis. That is the end of the analysis. So it all stands and falls with, do we have a violation of the standstill obligation at this juncture? Um, standing, you've heard a lot about, I won't go into this, just to say competitors are directly affected, have standing because of that competitive relationship um, and their position is harmed. Um, third parties, we've heard, true, um, they have chances, I mean, very difficult analysis, don't need to repeat this, but um, clearer cases are those where they have actually been paying a tax or a charge that has directly financed the aid. Those are the most clear cut situations. Others are very, very difficult um, and need to be carefully assessed. Now, once you have an opening decision, that suddenly changes. And why does it change? because the commission has taken a decision. The commission has said, we have doubts about compatibility, and basically that means there's a fair chance that Article 1083 is violated. And because that is the case, national courts at that juncture are already, as we've heard, obliged to safeguard um, the interests of third parties that are affected by the potential distortion of competition that the Commission has now started to formally investigate. So again, going back, you have a Commission decision that's binding on member states. Even if it is appealed, that has no suspensive effect. And the Commission has taken a view as to there possibly being a violation of 1083, and that explains why national courts are obliged to take all due consequences from that, even though it's preliminary view um, that there might be a violation of 1083. And that means they can order recovery with interest, they can order preliminary recovery with interest, uh, because it's a preliminary um, decision um, of the commission. So that is a possibility. But they cannot stay and just await the outcome of whatever happens in Brussels. That's no longer an obligation, uh, an option. Excuse me. Now, how is this different at the end of the um, preliminary investigation if you have a decision that either confirms there's no aid or says the aid is compatible, but you disagree as a competitor, because you've gone into national court, you have a procedure pending, and suddenly comes out the commission with such a decision? How does that change the situation? 
Well, what it does is, again, the National Court will not be able to disagree with the Commission at that point. So if the Court wants to second guess in your, the competitor's interest, what the Commission has decided, so wants to think that, or does think, well, maybe the Commission's gotten it wrong. Maybe it is aid. Maybe it's incompatible aid. What they then can do is they can refer a question to the Court of Justice on the matter. They wouldn't be asking the Commission in that circumstance. Um, they can do that, and they can order um, interim measures, or can't they? What do you think? Can national courts do that at this juncture? They can't. It's very difficult for them to do that. Um, they shouldn't do that, with, would, the would be what the commission would argue. Why? Because you have a binding commission decision. Um, but if you are a competitor, you might think about challenging that in the EU law courts in Luxembourg. So you could go to the general court and challenge it there directly, which is probably what you should be doing. But that's a different discussion. So mind you, whenever these types of scenarios unfold, think back, what does primacy of EU law say? And how does national sort of autonomy of the courts play in? And that will help you navigate this. Now, on to, once you have a final decision, a negative decision with recovery. Well, you would think once you have a final decision, all's clear. And that's true where you have that negative decision with recovery. Um, there, the obligation of immediate and effective recovery, we've heard, um, it says two plus two months typically in a decision. If you are a national court, a case comes to you. Um, you know you have to grant recovery um, with interest. Um, if you have doubts, you would actually have to refer to the Court of Justice. Um, the Commission would argue you couldn't grant um, sort of um, interim measures, or you shouldn't, um, except with the high thresholds uh, of Atalanta and Zuckerfabrik, which are relatively um, rarely ever met. Um, now, if you have a positive decision of unlawful aid found compatible, as a national court, you must think about the illegality interest that we've talked about, because that still needs to be recovered. You can't leave that hanging out. That would be a benefit that otherwise the beneficiary of unlawful aid would be able to keep. So you wouldn't be meeting your obligations to actually reverse, undo the competitive harm caused by the aid. So that is something that's important um, if you are a competitor um, to, if that happens, remind the court of. <coughs> now, if there's an appeal, what happens? Well, no suspensive effect. So um, that doesn't really change the situation for the national court. Um, they can try and um, grant interim measures, but they must be effective. So whatever the commission decision that's under appeal, um, the, the interim result must be effective implementation of that decision. So if that decision is a negative decision with recovery, there must be full and effective recovery. That can be provisional to the extent that you, as a court, you order this until such time as there's a final court decision um, and, and you pick that up again at that uh, juncture. Um, and again, um, if you have an annulment of a recovery decision, um, then there will be no recovery, um, uh, but the beneficiary will go um, to the national courts typically um, and national authorities and effect reimbursement of the aid. Um, but that's also uh, something that happens entirely under national law. So. On that juncture, let's change gear. And you've seen, basically, 
where there is a recovery decision, beneficiaries um, might have great difficulties because competitors uh, are very thoroughly protected by um, judgments out of the European courts in terms of the remedies when it comes to recovery um, that national law must grant them. So the flip side of that, the beneficiary. What are the defenses? We've heard, and I won't deal with that, defenses under national law. So um, the authority that's asking recovery of me is the wrong authority. Um, they've missed deadlines. Um, they've made other mistakes under procedural national law. Um, those you will all be making and they will all be heard. Um, but illegality of the commission's recovery decision, so on substance, because of course your national authority will go back and will rectify all those. Um, so does that actually help you much? It might instantly help you, but we've had there must be effective recovery. So the commission will see to it that your national authority will keep trying and keep trying until they get it right. Um, so to the core of the argument, um, can you plead illegality of the commission recovery decision? Not really, except when you've gone to Luxembourg and you've challenged the recovery decision that was taken against the member state. Important, you don't get a, re a commission recovery decision as a beneficiary um, or an alleged beneficiary. So you must make sure that once you see the publication of that decision in the official journal that you go to the general court in Luxembourg within two months and 10 days and file your annulment action. If you don't, the national court will not hear you with any argument because they're not allowed to. Um, uh, that there was an illegal recovery decision at EU level. So you can't get that out of the way anymore. The only exception is if you don't have any standing in the general court. Those scenarios do happen. They're very, very rare and it's dangerous um, unless you're very clear that you don't have standing. So to trust that you wouldn't have had standing, um, it's not a good idea if you're wanting to effectively defend before a national court against a recovery decision. Absolute impossibility, a great defense, but when do you have it? Well, if after liquidation, out of a bankruptcy proceeding, you've picked up a company and there's no continuity. Apart from that, good luck. You're not going to defend on impossibility. Um, I can't pay, the beneficiary no longer exists because I've had an, you know, sort of corporate restructuring, um, doesn't work. Interesting, legitimate expectations. I thought I never received any aid. And the member state said so. And national courts said so. There's actually litigation going on. Um, and you know, my national courts have said earlier there wasn't any aid. Doesn't help you. First, any assurance by any member state authority, it's not worth anything. What you need is a binding decision from the commission saying there is no aid or the aid is compatible. That's the only way out here. Um, if you're accused of having received aid, that's a dead sure defense, but that rarely ever happens that um, a claimant gets it so wrong or an authority gets it so wrong. So as a diligent businessman, any company knows state aid law inside out. That's the theory. I mean, granted, you know, this is difficult for lawyers that specialize in state aid law in some instances. And even the commission does get it wrong every now and then. But if you are an economic operator, if you run a company, you know all of that. 
and you take that state aid risk and that is recovery with full interest. And that's where you're left. So that's really harsh, really difficult to understand. But unless you've gotten assurance from the commission directly, which they pay great attention to not giving, only very, very exceptionally will the commission give you assurance outside a formal commission decision that there is no aid or that aid is compatible. So even if, and that's happened, um, you start or you try to rely on a last instance national court that there's no state aid and they've specifically, the national court of last instance has specifically looked at the state aid issue and have said there is no state aid, that will not save you from recovery based on a commission recovery decision that's become binding. Primacy of EU law, you're stuck, basically. So, is there an exception? Can there be an exception of res judicata? Well, res judicata is a fundamental principle of EU law that's often argued. Um, and the EU courts in Luxembourg have accepted it in principle. So that is the principle that at some point in time there should be silence, one should accept um, unappealable court decisions. And that can even be, EU law courts have said, a national decision. But the thresholds are so enormously high um, why? We come back to the initial obligation that we've discussed uh, that member state courts are subject to, um, meaning if there's a difficulty under national law in the procedure that is keeping them from ordering effective recovery, they need to disregard it. So that's why in most of the instances where res judicata played um, an issue, EU courts have said, well, there was another way, another method for you, national court, to disregard, to work around that judgment, or to still appeal it. So it's a very, very difficult concept. And um, I've given you a few examples here. So. Um, if you have a national court decision that becomes binding after a commission opening decision, you understand why EU law says, well, that is not going to help you against the final commission recovery decision because before that court judgment became final, you already knew the commission had taken a decision that opened the formal investigation. The commission had already said their state aid. So overriding principle um, of primacy of EU law, um, that must be guarded. Effective recovery in those instances, you don't deserve to be protected because you couldn't trust in that legal decision of your national court that became binding after the commission had taken the opposite position. And that's why res judicata does not work in those circumstances. Um, the same applies when that recovery decision has become final and you have a national court decision that becomes unappealable and final after that and says there was no state aid because that is a national court decision directly um, contradicting an EU commission decision that's become binding. So again, primacy of EU law rules, you must have effective recovery. Um, and you cannot trust in that later national court judgment. An interesting one <coughs> is the third um, case, the Slovak Republic. There, um, interestingly, um, there was a national court decision that became unappealable uh, before a commission recovery decision was issued. And the difficulty here was that that national court decision approved um, a resolution in a liquidation context where the state um, agreed not to collect certain debt 
from the company. And that was later found by the Commission to involve state aid. And in that circumstance, there was a preliminary ruling by the court that was called upon to implement the, or decide whether or not to implement the recovery decision because the beneficiary said way before the commission decision, I had a court judgment of our Supreme Court in the Slovak Republic and that's become binding. That tells me that settlement did not involve state aid. That was a very, very tricky case, and it's, it's really, if you're interested in this, it's worth reading the Advocate General and the judgment in this, because um, it very neatly dissects for you all those conditions and all the arguments that went, went back and forth. But fortunately for the Court of Justice, they didn't have to decide it because the Advocate General showed them the way out. What was that? Well, there was um, sort of an extraordinary appeal that, um, the Slovak government had mentioned um, and it was unclear before the court whether that had been made use of or not. So this was a case where um, the Court of Justice said, well, you haven't done everything, member state. You must recover. There is no res judicata here. So a very, very interesting fact scenario. There might be circumstances where you can actually rely on final uh, national court decisions, but they're far and few in between, and I haven't seen one. So why, while the EU courts pay lip service to this being a very important principle and one that applies, it applies in theory as far as I know, but hasn't been successful in practice. So. That gets us to the one interesting um, scenario that transpired recently, and we've heard about it already this morning, Media Set 3. Why? Because there have been an appeal to the General Court and appeal to the Court of Justice, direct appeals, um, unsuccessful, and then came the recovery in National Court and Media Set 3. Um, the one we've been hearing about this morning was the preliminary ruling of the court called upon to actually implement the recovery here. And that's a very interesting case, I agree. Um, but you have to be very, very careful to rely on it because it was a case of indirect aid where the Commission had great difficulty in, in drafting the recovery decision and recovery order. Um, so it wasn't quite clear who the beneficiaries were. That was clarified but how to actually calculate that indirect aid that those potential beneficiaries might have received was extremely difficult. And there are more and more cases in which the calculation of aid that might be recovered is very, very complex. So maybe Mediaset will have a few more um, fields of application in the future. Um, and the important things to note are, one, just the confirmation that, of course, um, national authorities and courts are not bound by um, exchanges that they have with the Commission during the period in which the Commission monitors full recovery and is recovery happening and are you, as a member state, doing all the right things, have you computed it correctly, all those good things where a lot of member states um, sort of cooperate very, very closely and rightly so with the Commission to get it right and to understand. But it's their obligation to actually compute aid. And in media set, that's what had happened. Um, there had been a lot of communications back and forth um, and still, um, and eventually the member state ordered recovery from media set. Um, but media set fundamentally disagreed and said, well, you know, whatever help you've gotten from the Commission, member state, you've gotten it wrong. Um, there were experts uh, called in by the court to look at the issues, so they got independent third party advice on the calculation, on the formulas applied, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of that, 
the court said, oh, can I say the aid to be recovered is zero? And that's how it got to Luxembourg on a preliminary ruling. And very, very interestingly, um, the court actually came out with that slightly Solomonic um, sort of approach to saying, well, if you look at everything, including the correspondence with the commission, following the recovery um, decision, which you must take into account, you can't just ignore, uh, to your point, um, that is something that the court confirmed again. So if you ask the commission a question, beware, you might get an answer. And then whether you like it or not, you need to do something with it. You can't just ignore. So whether you want to ask a question, something you um, need to answer before you do that as a member state. But anyway, um, so if you take into account all those uh, factors, including advice that you've gotten and sort of expert reports and all of that, yes, it's your obligation. You then conclude on whether the member state has correctly established the amount of aid to be recovered. And if they haven't done it correctly, and if you, based on the evidence before you find the amount is zero, you can establish the amount to be recovered to zero. But you cannot question the Commission's decision. So you say, there is a binding decision, and in the exercise of my jurisdiction, in terms of looking at whether the computation of the amount to be recovered, the Member State has made a mistake, I have come to the conclusion that yes, there was a mistake, and the Member State should have said to be recovered is an amount of zero euro. That works. But again, I think very rare circumstances in which that will actually um, be brought to bear effectively. But it's always worth trying if you're challenging a recovery decision to say, well, the amount is wrong and um, work on that. So where does that leave me? All's well for competitors, but little hope for beneficiaries. I think if you look at what the position is under the jurisprudence that you'll find cited throughout uh, the presentation, and if you listen to what the commission makes of it, that's true. It's very little hope for beneficiaries, and it looks like its situation is excellent at, for competitors to get recovery, to get the distortion undone in national courts. The reality, I'm afraid, that I'm aware of doesn't quite mirror that. It still doesn't. National courts often struggle. Um, there's one interesting case um, to watch, which is uh, C50514. Uh, it's another one on res judicata. Um, a very interesting case. If you're interested, follow that. Um, if you read it, it shows you how a national court can struggle between wanting to be doing the right thing, but not quite jumping the hurdle. Because I think in this case, you will find if you apply primacy, principles and the other principles that we've had, you will come to the conclusion that, no, unfortunately, there's, again, a situation where recovery will have to happen. But again, um, more clarification to come out of Luxembourg on that preliminary request. Um, and then, unfortunately, still, we even find sort of highest national courts flat out ignoring. Um, and, and that is probably uh, the most outrageous. Um, but it, it does happen, um, and I'm afraid um, I can say that. I happen to be German qualified, but German courts are pretty good at that, um, at just ignoring. And saying um, openly, and that is what's um, cited here, that was a case where um, a German Supreme Court actually went out to say, well, there's a commission opening decision, and we see the commission thinks that there is um, aid possibly out there, but we disagree, and we don't care what the Commission has said. Did the court refer? No. It decided. So. Anyway, um, very outrageous. But um, in practical terms, what we see in practice is um, 
knowledge of national courts, and we've heard that this morning already, is differs quite a bit. So you can get to very sophisticated courts that really know this inside out, that take the time to learn up to it, um, and very expeditiously navigate these rules. You can have less sophisticated courts, but oftentimes you will not know. It always pays off um, to follow your goals, whether you are a beneficiary or you are a competitor, because regardless of what you've heard this morning, you might win a national court to actually help you. And that particularly applies, and I will say this, to um, alleged beneficiaries. We see on the ground quite a bit of willingness of courts to apply creative solutions in the wake of having to somehow recover. Um, so we've seen courts, while we were challenging commission recovery decisions in Luxembourg, to find somewhat negotiated solutions where they said, well, maybe, yes, um, how about you recover a proportion of the aid with interest until such time as there is a final decision out of Luxembourg. And that was something that, and I don't know, but um, that um, went ahead, let me put it that way. Um, we know the commission didn't like it. But anyway, so I, I think it's definitely a playground where there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but um, what I would wish for would be um, if I could, the notice on the notion of aid, because that will help national courts in the very beginning to assess are they looking at aid or not when there's nothing really at EU level that the Commission has said or done that would help them. That's one. And then a revision of the other notices, maybe, because they're quite dated at this point. So I think if there was willingness at the Commission to complete modernization also on those more technical notices, I think that might actually help national courts. Because yes, I mean, there's training going on and ERA does, does quite a fair share of that as well. But um, it reaches only those judges that are wanting to learn more. And it's not so readily available to, to all courts and all judges um, in member states. But with that, let me close. And if there's any questions, please.